let's start with the fundamental basics. And like I said, I'm not the target audience here, but I always learn when I talk to you. So that's good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So an ATS, applicant tracking system resume, is uh, very particular. It's drawn, it's built by developers and programmers who actually probably, to be honest, have never even written a resume in their life. I find that quite amusing. But mm -hmm. anyway, so so they built it around a certain format and a certain content. No shading, no underlines. You can have um, you can have hyperlinks, but you can't have underlines. Certain bullets, you can only have one block of text of four lines or more. The rest has to be three lines. So just those things, there's a whole long shopping list, the laundry list of other stuff will count. Lots of people out when they apply for a job on Monster, Workopolis, um, LinkedIn or whatever, uh, or they give it to somebody or an executive recruiter. They may be the perfect candidate, but just simply because their resume isn't ATS scannable, that's going to count them out just like that. And they're gone. And that's really sad. So when I did, I, mean, I write a resume right now in this economy, seven days a week, one resume, sometimes one and a half resumes a day. Uh, and um, you have to comply by that developers, programmers format. Don't vary from it. One character out and you're gone. So it's so sad. So I've seen so many people, you know, just made minor tinkering with their resumes and they come brought it back into ATS and then they get interviewed. How strange, you know? That's the mm. way of the world. Yeah. Well, it's still garbage in, garbage out, right? If uh, if, yeah. if you're if you're submitting something that the system views as, as garbage, uh, it'll stop right there. So you hit a few things right at the top in terms of structure. Maybe walk me through that structure element a bit more. You know, that you were talking about the multi lines and whatnot, and, and yeah. you obviously, you know, that there's patterns uh, across all those thousands of resumes that, that you've developed. And there's a lot of unique elements, obviously, because, you know, both to the job and to the individual, but let's, let's maybe look at patterns and maybe elaborate on some sure. of those patterns. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could keep you here till tomorrow morning, breakfast <laughs> tomorrow morning, but, but you know what? It, so, so it, the, the resume obviously starts off with your name at the top, bold capital centers. So then underneath that, so not next year, this is a, this is a classic example of how it can trick you. Um, and you can, can be counted out. These are their acronyms for their degrees and their designations. Normally, in the old way, we put them right next to your name. Well, now, if you have an NBA, a PMP, and a BSC or something, the, the scanning machinery, if you put that right next to your name, will think your name is NBA, PMP, BSC. So you have to put it underneath your name. So you put all your designations underneath your name. And then, and then you have uh, your full residential address. And people highlight, you know, they bold and uh, almost capitalize their address. I'm not really interested where you live, but you have to have it there. So small, no, no, just lowercase initial capitals, full residential address. And then the, in this order, this is the way it's programmed by the ATS, those programmers. So you have your phone number first, your email second, your LinkedIn address third, and make sure you customize your LinkedIn address. So if you've got numbers and letters after your name, you haven't customized your LinkedIn address. So you need to go and customize that for two reasons. A, it's far more professional. And B, Google in its algorithm visits your LinkedIn profile and it's going over your profile, going all over every single thing on the internet all the time. As soon as you do that for free, we'll give you a 400% uplift. So take those numbers and letters out after your name. That's the default they gave you. And then customize it and save it. And then put that on your resume. And then the fourth thing on that one line beneath your residential address. And this is really uh, interesting. This is the way of the world. You now need to have, need to have your Zoom address. So your 11 digit number that Zoom give you when you sign up for your account. So that's, that's the way of the world now. So uh, in that order, and then underneath that, you have a very thin line, a wafer thin line, and then you have uh, your directive. So what are you gonna do? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna be, want to become a chief marketing officer, uh, you put senior, generically, it, it would be senior marketing leader, and then you customize it. So you might see tomorrow, vice president of marketing, or director of marketing, or CMO, or whatever. So you put the title of that, but generically, it will be a senior marketing leader. And then you put your four areas of expertise within that function. So it could be competitive analysis. It could be B2B marketing, B2C, B2G, B2E, uh, all sorts of different things. And then 
underneath that, you have your personal brand. Now, this is something I'm really passionate about. You know, this applies to you, Robert, as well. Mm. Everybody has their own personal brand. So basically, in a nutshell, what is, what is so special about you, Robert? If I was in a hiring position, you were on the market, you mm. were looking for a job, what, what is your value? What is your competitive edge? Give me a reason in a statement, and I'll home in on that in a minute. Mm. Uh, why should I, if I was hiring somebody with your skill set, why should I hire you over Mary, Mark, or Paul? Those mm -hmm. are the competition. So it's yep. your unique promise about you, your competitive edge, your differentiator. Oh, by the and way, people... let, let me interject two seconds there, because you, you've seen me go through a few. Uh, we're working with a, a new one lately, and I'd love to get your, your two cents on it. Uh, abstract big thinker. Yeah, so that's good. So that's very impressive. But to tighten it even more or to strengthen it even more, psychology, there's a lot of psychology goes into mm -hmm. this. Psychologists tell us that the human mind, our mind, doesn't matter where you are in the world, all minds are the same, uh, 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 pick up, picks up on uh, uh, statements in 15, 17, or 19 words. Mm -hmm. Don't go to 18, mm -hmm. don't go to 20, don't go to 16. So I think yours was about four or five. So I think it, well, I had I had the three uh, the so mine would be the three words that I'm starting. So that would be building out into a proper sentence, as you say. If yeah, it, yeah, like, sure. So you elaborate on value yeah. and you know. So this is your sales proposition, yeah, exactly. To it, but personal, not nothing to do with business. Mm -hmm. And then so 15, 17, or nineteen words. You do that in bold italics, lowercase, with the first letter of the first word capitalized. And then you go. Then you have a line space. And then you have a four to five line block paragraph mm. and the four key things they're looking for. When I write a resume, I know all the, the questions that an executive recruiter or an HR professional or any other decision maker interviewer is going to ask you in an interview. So I try and put the, uh, I call them the sweaty palm, twiddling your thumb, shuffling your butt questions. They're mm. going to get asked. They're the ones to, to throw you off, to, 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 get, to, to get you a bit nervous, shaky if you're not already nervous. Mm. So uh, so uh, the four, quest four things you need to put in this four to five line block paragraph are, this is a new interview question. And so many people come together with, oh my God, that frightens me, the wussy word. So <laughs> what one word would describe you? Now, I'm not interested in a wussy word like passionate, driven, or successful. Of course you are. Mm. I'm interested in unusual words. So I'm going to give you some of my most recent class. The one I really like um, is electrifying. Mm. Like this guy was a chief operating officer and every, virtually every resume in COVID in Zurich, he sent out. So Zurich's a very small town compared to other towns, your big cities. Um, uh, he sent out, he got an interview. So, you know, that was a contributory factor, end all, but it was a contributory factor. So there are other words like... Uh, unstoppable, mm. unflappable, tenacious, audacious, resilient, pioneer, intrepid, robust, courageous. So put that first word, that one word you decided, don't just pick anything out of the dictionary and think, oh, that looks really good. I'm going to put that on your resume because you've got to be prepared to defend that. Yeah. And then you have your leadership style, how to describe your leadership, uh, leadership. How do you lead? Because as we all lead differently and then uh, describe your communication style there again, you communicate different to what I do. And then lastly, in that paragraph, you have what you're renowned for. Now, this is the business for what you're renowned mm. for, not your personal. So don't duplicate through your personal brand. And then, then you go uh, into a table or a column format and you put all those business functional specific buzzwords are pertinent to you because that ATS is not only scanning, it's also a database. Mm -hmm. So if your resume was hidden in my computer, in my ATS, and you were a finance guy and you had zero uh, uh, functional words, you'd be, you would never get found. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the functional um, uh, buzzwords that are pertinent to you. So in a finance, you know, accounting is a, Financial planning and analysis, FPNA. You always put the acronym as well because you never know where they're mm -hmm. going to type in the full word or, or the acronym. Man management discussion and analysis, internal controls, you know, uh, risk management, uh, uh, treasury. This list goes on general accounting, GAP, IFRS. This Your goes traditional on keyword on. SEO style. Yeah. Research. I, I tell my client, all, all the viewers should think about, well, 
if my resume was hidden in my computer, what business functional specific buzzwords would I type in to have my resume come out? And you can chop and change them. You can reprioritize them, whatever. But so that I'm, I'm going to suggest you need about 18. So three columns of six or two columns of nine. And then you go into a, uh, then you, uh, so now you're a third of the way down the first page. Um, and now you go into your professional experience. Now, so many people, this is a cardinal sin, even before the advent of ATS. They sell their company more than they are the position. Now, is this Bell Canada's resume or is this your resume? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not your employer's resume. Yeah, Bell Canada, a great company to go to work for, but you're not selling your company. You are selling your position. So you de-emphasize, take the bold out, take the, the capital letters out of the company, and you emphasize the, um, the, 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 the position. So then you have your dates over in the right margin. You can't have them on the left margin. This is ATS. So you have them on the right margin. Never put months except in an eight, um in a, um, a, an IT resume. Mm -hmm. And then you, you have the highlight, you, you highlight the bold, capitalize the position. And then underneath that, you take the bold off. And in a smaller typeface, in, um, in brackets, you have to have the measurable. So you have to have number of direct reports, number of indirect reports, your CapEx budget, your OPEX budget, and your PL. Of course, mm -hmm. some people don't have them. So if you don't have them, you're not a leader yet, and you're on way up. Mm -hmm. That's fine too. And then, and then the world revolves around, they're going to hire anybody who's watching this video right now. They're going to hire you not for your responsibilities. They're going to hire you because you can make them money, save them money, streamline operations, eliminate headcount, introduce new systems and practices, processes, uh, softwares, hardwares, uh, re-engineer the department, uh, the list goes on and on and on. You're going to be hired for your performance. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't call myself a resume writer anymore, CV writer anymore. I call myself a, a storyteller. Mm -hmm. So I tell stories based on my client's successes built around the acronym called STAR. So situation, task, action, result. Now, if you saved the world or made them a gazillion dollars, that's a huge thing. If you, if you make me, a, if I can see you make the thou, a, a gazillion dollars or even a million dollars, you know, I would probably like to interview you, but you need to tell the story that went on behind that. So coming back to the ATS, I mentioned it earlier, you only allow one block of text of four lines or more, and you've already taken that up top. Everything else has to be three lines. So mm, okay. make, making a million dollars or a gazillion dollars or whatever, there's a lot of processes and practices that go on in between that. So you need to, have to talk about that situation, task, action, result. So you can you, you can do the situation and the task maybe is one bullet. Maximum of three lines, don't go to four lines. Mm -hmm. And then you can do the action and the result or the task, the action, the result as sub bullets. Mm -hmm. So... People, hiring authorities, doesn't matter where you are in the world, are looking for one and a half, this is the sort of the measurable, mm -hmm. one and a half star stories per year. Now, the further you go back, uh, the less important it becomes, unless you did make a gazillion dollars in 2006 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, they kind of concentrate on the last 10 or 15 years. But you still need to put all the positions or summarize all the positions because if you graduated and where I where I you know I work, I work at the senior executive level and those who aspire to be business leaders, um, they've got a long career history. So mm -hmm. you you need to have that, you need to fill in that eliminate all those red flags and and, and reason doubt because you're going to put your your degrees at the bottom of your of page two or page three. So uh, Canadian and the bulk of resumes across the world are three pages where I operate at the senior and, 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 and aspiring business leaders. But uh, in the US, it's two pages. Mm -hmm. So um, never, ever, ever, ever one page resume. A one page resume went out a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but sadly, universities, even for master's programs, graduates, they give them a one page 
they say that's the right format. It's it, not. It, my, my view is if you're going to do a one page, you're not viewing it as a resume, you're viewing it as a landing page. So yeah, the, no, exactly. the targeting, yeah. that's either a targeted newsletter to yeah. a, you know, a specific yeah. person or, or a handoff, yeah. but it's, it's that step beyond the elevator speech, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. and in that case, you know, it, you're dealing with the person specifically. So you better be writing it for that individual, not for a computer, if you know what I mean. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 So so it's very particular. Uh, you And the, the rule of thumb here, again, is you fill pages. So you yeah. don't do two and a half or two and a third or two and a quarter. I know everybody has enough to fill either two pages or three pages. I mean, some of my clients, they can go into eight or 10 pages. In fact, some of them, they send me 15 pages like, oh, my gosh. Well, I know in Canada... If you go to four pages or more, you reduce your chances of having it read by 93%. Wow. In the UK, it's 97%. Wow. So do you want to play to that 3% or do you want to play to the 97%? Wow. And the scanning machinery will kick you out anyway. So, yeah. So it's very, very particular. It's your sales tool. It's your brochure. It's your window to the world. And it highlights you and gives you one, just one opportunity to shine to get you through to the interview because a resume doesn't get you the job. It gets you the interview. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I, I've had to take a slightly different approach in, in the last 10 years. Um, but fundamentally I look at everything that's prior to the last decade as being, you know, the, the, the veteran ITIS years. And I kind of group all that together. You know, it's sure. not, yeah. it's not individual careers. I don't even talk about the businesses anymore because, you know, maybe a couple more for reference sake, but as you say, it's, what did you do during those 20 odd years? Yeah. Um, you know, big systems, big responsibilities. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, but uh, what I look at the last 10 years, it's just now that I'm able to start rational rationalizing what that decade was because you've seen you know oh. we've, we've chatted about this uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's undescribable uh, to me uh, and i've actually hired a few people to work with now who's part of their job uh is to be an outsider viewpoint because you know we were joking about this before we started recording you know you know all this stuff about resume but when it comes to like technology i know all this stuff right we can only know so much about yeah. oh, certain yeah. things right. you know yeah and yeah. the biggest thing that I decided that I was going to do, and I said I was going to do it, so I'm glad I did, was the second that I started getting serious about going back into the industry, which is kind of what I'm doing right now again, uh, the first thing I would yeah. do is hire an assistant, you know, uh, take some of my yeah. own money and put it towards uh, someone. And I regret not doing that yeah, sure. when I was a corporate, you know, whatever with the salary to do it properly. Uh, so that, that's the right. first bit. The next bit is finding a, a proper advisor, you know, so having those mindsets, yes. of you can't do it alone. You need uh, people to keep you accountable. You need people to help you with the stuff you don't know. Like I'm getting into global yeah, taxation exactly. now, right? I'm not a global taxation specialist. You know, uh, I did not expect yeah. uh, 2020 to be the blowout year internationally. Uh, you know, so all of those realities okay. come in yeah. and to your point, you can't do it alone. Yeah. And I've got a commerce degree and this is kind of lead into your EMBA. So it's not as if I don't understand all this stuff, but my native area is digital yeah. and tech. That's, that's, that's my sweet spot. Yeah. And you build around that. So let's use that as a segue. You deal with a lot of people that have re-educated themselves through the EMBA program. Now that covers a wide spectrum of sure. people that are either come from an arts background and realize they needed to understand business more people that came from a business background that just need to refresh and regrow. Uh, a lot of it is how sure. we view technology in the space of business. And I think that's the part that really has changed a lot of the views of MBA yeah. out there. I, when I think of MBA, I think of it as counter to a lot of the stuff that was in place. Yeah. Because I'll be honest, every time that we as technologists had brilliant ideas, it was an MBA that shot it down right, every sure. time, right? So the education needs to encounter the reality of the space we live in. And I think there was a disconnect there for a while. I'm going back a few decades here, right? So yeah. your view on traditional MBA versus current EMBA or, you know, or that general style so, of question. Yeah. So an MBA, you can do uh, as, as soon as you graduate, you don't even need to go into the workforce. You can do as soon as you graduate from an undergraduate. You can stay at school and do your MBA. 
So you don't have the experience in the workforce, whereas an EMBA, an Executive Master of Business Administration, there's certain criteria for you to get admitted to business schools. And there's about 130, 140 programs around the world. Um, and they uh, they top out at 220,000 US dollars for that program. So, you know, so it's, it's a fair chunk of change. You, know, you can go down to, you can go down to a few thousand, but uh, so- It's but, an so, investment uh, on, on yeah, the next 20 years. Yeah. yeah. But so, so it's a, it, you have to have leadership, but you have to show your leadership capabilities. You have to be in the workforce, anything over 10 plus years and all, all sorts of criteria. So it's, it's for executives and those who aspire to be executives. And that's just where my private practice is. So I uncovered this niche thanks to Ivy Business School, Western, um, uh, 2007. And now I've become the guru, the expert, or whatever you want to call it, the authority on managing and advancing the careers of executive master of business administrations. Yeah, I work with MBAs as well, but my expertise is EMBAs. And it's a tough, tough degree because you have to actually be at work while you're doing the degree. So some of them are, you know, every other weekend or every third or fourth weekend or long weekends. And then some of them are modules once every quarter or every four or five months. And they have to, sometimes they travel all over the world, yeah. but they also have to work and they have projects during the week. So some of those executives, you know, they're working minimum of 40 hours a week. So normally, you know, an executive, uh, the average is 60 hours a week. If you're Plus, lucky, if you're to, lucky. Yeah, if you're lucky. <laughs> so then they have to do another 20 or 30 hours project work yeah. for their EMBA. On top of that, it's kiss your goodbye to your family, you know, your, your spouses and your kids and all your social life. You dedicate, and the programs run anything between 15 months and two years, depending on which program you go into. Um, uh, you, you have to kiss goodbye to life. But you know what? The rewards are, are terrific. You can actually get that $200,000 USD back. Um, I've had clients engage me and I coach them and I prepare the resume and LinkedIn profile and whatever, um, get that map back in um, three years. So yeah. 30, uh, 33 to 36 months, if you push it. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's like everything else. Like when I rebuilt you know, the, this current generation of my business, you know, I'm still bootstrapping, but everything I do looks at, at it from a, if I do this, I'm going to be that much better here, or I'm going to be able to leverage this sure. or whatnot. And it's all part of the larger play, because at the end of the yeah. day, if you're able to get three to five times return on your investment and whatever that may be, that's fairly expected. So to spend 200,000, knowing that you might be able to pull off two, three million dollars worth of revenue as salary oh, yeah. over the next whatever yeah. years, yeah. Uh, it, you know, if you're able to stay on that train and that, you know, that's the right. biggest problem I find is if you get off that train, you can't get back on, you know, that no, was no. my biggest realization when I, when I left corporate, the, yeah. you can't get back on that train. It, it's, it's oh. easy to go from compartment to compartment, but yeah, that's a good way of uh, analogy. Yeah. That's yeah. A good way of Funny. Yeah. So, so you can, um, so what you learn, if you go to a weekend or you go for a module somewhere, you know, that two week module or whatever, what you learn in that two week module or that weekend, you can instantly put into your corporate world yeah. that week, straight there after the week. And people learn. Well, so it's very agilistic that way. Yeah. And I have the privilege because I, I go and teach on the MBA programs across the world or did prior to COVID. And uh, I sat in on some of the, of the professors' lectures and whatever. And wow, they're like mind blowing. They're, they really are mind blowing. But you know, they cover the whole gamut of leadership from mm. anything. So you come out of it a far better leader, not just in marketing or sales or supply chain or finance. You got the whole thing. You're not an expert in everything, but you at least know the general knowledge. So and it's highly regarded in today's COVID situation when you know competition has got more fierce um embas have really come into their own uh and uh it's a very highly respected and valuable degree to take far more than an mba because an mba is a bit different yeah well as you say an em uh, an mba is education without context yeah yeah, I'm, I'm not diminishing yeah. it. It's a lot of knowledge to maintain. Yeah. It's a lot of knowledge to know. Yeah. It's more knowledge than yeah. I know. 
Uh, I do know this, when I decided that I would go into IT, uh, well, IS, information systems at the yeah. time, um, I came at it from a commerce background, right? So immediately sure. that separated me from every single other technologist that right. well, at, at the time it was EDS, but yeah, most of the EDS yeah. people were pure tech. And I right. came in there with a commerce understanding. I understood the finance. I understood the accounting. I understand the, 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 the operation, and whatnot. So right. when they dropped me at, at General Motors, you know, my ability to interact with the business uh, was definitely not that of a first year person, if you know what oh, I mean. Yeah. So I can only imagine the same model applied, you know, 20, yeah. 30 years later in your life, if you will. Sure. Uh, and you now, could go but, back and do an MBA. You, 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 could, you could go I, and do an MBA. I think, I think they do it at the, uh, ca the campus in Bradford, where you yeah. are. They do it at the Waterloo camp. Is it University of Waterloo? Uh, Laurier? It's Laurier. No, it's Laurier. Laurier. Yeah. My, yeah. No, I, I put that money into something much larger, to be honest. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've spent considerably more than what I would if I had gone back. And that was actually a fundamental decision that I made back, you know, when I left corporate was, where do I want to go? And right. to your point, I could have gone off and spent $250,000 on a proper MBA back in the time, because yeah. I don't think the executive MBA lasted. And I wasn't employable at the time. So, you know, I wouldn't have qualified to start with, right? So that's the most I would have walked away with was maybe an MBA. Uh, but it would have put me back into the same train that I had left, yeah. right? That's so part of the not getting the MBA is to not get back on that train, for lack of a better term. Right. And I'm, I'm exposing yeah. a bit more about me than I should, but fundamentally that is it. But where I took all of that time and learning, uh, like the amount of self-taught aspects of what I do, like I, I, I jerry-rigged a, a four HDMI to USB uh, encoder streaming kit with you know two major monitors all off of an iMac and I'm just walking away on wires and I'm understanding all this stuff. That wasn't me 10 years ago. The technologist was there, but my understanding yeah, of video yeah, wasn't yeah. there, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. uh, or streaming, or even when we were talking about virtual cameras and stuff like that. So that's where I spent my time and my money is, is developing that. Um, and, but the same idea is there is I viewed it as an investment and it better pay off because otherwise I lost millions of dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I truly understand um, when you put your own money in your own time, whether or not it's going for an executive MBA or anything, being an entrepreneur or whatever, you it's your own money. And if it's yeah. completely different when you go to school with someone else's cash. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, there's so many opportunities available for you online now mm -hmm. in the IT space, that big IT space, you know, cybersecurity is yep. huge and all the jazz and then risk and, you know, all the, all the nuts and bolts and all that stuff. I don't, you know, as you know, I don't understand all that stuff. But you could do, you, you could do a, a short, very short, swift course out of the University of Oxford mm -hmm. or University of Cambridge or a London Business School or one of the other global universities. And that will, when it's a sales point as well, you know, you can you can tell them you've done a, a course or a mm -hmm. diploma or certificate. There's various you know yep. labels for them. Um, you can tell them you've done that, and that's a great sales pitch if you're pitching for a contract for the corporate, uh, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a, a temporary contract to go and help them. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. It's it's. Uh... You know, like I said, to me, I, I've, I've always been heavy inbound marketing. Uh, and like I said, there's executives that I deal with that should not know who I am. Right. Yeah. And, I, and uh, they would never have known who I was if I, even if I had followed every single perfect example. Um, right. Sure. You know, how do I want to say this? We're all storytellers and my storytelling is through podcasting and interviews yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Well, right? And, and to me, if, 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 if every one of my interviews was a submission, it was perfectly crafted for that particular audience at that particular time. And I've yeah. done, as you say, much like you, hundreds and hundreds of, of these things. Yeah. And yeah. that to me, it has become my style. Now, that is yeah. entirely based on me being able to uh, make the conversion of that contact. But once right. I've got that contact, 
uh, what they are able, as you say, what they're able to find out about me, what they can see about me. It's, you know, I would rather have a company in India say that I'm a digital media specialist to the world than me trying to say it to everybody else and not exactly. having to believe me, right? So that to me is the, the crux of what I've been trying to do. But, you know, it's, it's as you say, 10 years of building and building and, and, right. and prepping and whatnot. And it's that same effort that everybody should put into whatever they put that money into, whether or not it's an EMBA yeah. or, or, or yeah. whatever, it, it, you got to view it uh, as, as that it, it's, it's an investment. Like me, it's, it's my retirement plan, period. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's simple as that, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's got to work. Otherwise I'm, you know, whatever. You're going to be retiring. Yeah. You're going to be working until you're 99. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always joked, I will retire when I retire because I love doing what I do. And we've always joked about this. If, if it's not yeah. worked for me, right? Like I'm me, yeah. me monkeying around on some of this video stuff that I do. Uh, I've done it for free because it's enjoyable. You know, the, yeah. some of my best interviews for companies, I've never charged them for. Right. I should, but I don't yeah. because I've enjoyed it. It was a good conversation, you know, and, and to me, that is a sustainable path uh, and is, a, a, to me, a much better train that I've built <laughs> for myself. Yeah, well, entrepreneurs are more focused on staying in the, uh, uh, doing what they're passionate about and what they're experts in than if you were in a corporate life because, uh, well, they don't have a, all the financial backing of a corporate life either sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I will continue. I, I scale back on certain things, but I will continue. Yeah, as I, my life, you know, goes into shading. Yeah. You have to, you have to, yeah. and especially if it's something you enjoy. Like I said, I yeah. honestly believe that I will be on my deathbed and there will be a mic and I will be doing an interview as I'm dying. Yeah. Well, there you go. I like that attitude. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, no, not? The second yeah. I find out I'm dying, I'm having, you know, we were talking about some people that you want to interview. The second yeah. I find out I'm, I'm dying, the requests for those, you know, hail Mary interviews are going out. 